Hey everyone, for those of you that don't know Fred Capel, he is a legend in the industry. 35 years in the job, he's won numerous awards and he's built a fantastic business. We really hope you enjoy this episode as we take a deep dive into Fred's journey. Thank you. So Fred, thanks for your time, mate. I know how busy you are, and it's took a while to get this pin down because I've been asking you since, what, November of last year? You're very welcome. Yeah, I have put you off once or twice, to be fair. Um, so sorry about that. That's all right. I understand how busy you are. You cornered me eventually. Well, I just thought if I begged enough, you'd just feel sorry for me. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so tell us about the journey of Fred Capel. How did you get into the food business? Well, as a kid, um, I was brought up in the fruit and veg business in London. Um, My parents had a shop in West London and um, after school and on a Saturday, I used to work there and uh, unload the lorry and all that sort of stuff. And I loved it. Learned the value of a quid at a young age. So it was a really good grounding. Um, But my dad was smart. He could see what the supermarkets were doing to um, the independent shops like fruit and veg shops and butchers and and all those sort of things. And um, he thought he'd get out. This was 1979. Um, He wanted to get out of the area, get out of London. And I don't know how they ended up with Bournemouth. I think it was pretty much a drawing pin on a map. Um, But Bournemouth it was. And we moved down there and made... A similar mistake to what a lot of people do think that catering is, you know, I can cook a roast at home, so that's the way we'll go, you know. Mm. And they bought a a guest house in Bournemouth. I think it had 13 rooms in the January of 79. And um, it was really a baptism of fire. It it wasn't easy. Because it was small, it was too small to have staff, I helped out there, but really most of the work fell on my mum's shoulders and it, you know, it, it knocked her for six. It was, um, didn't work out. We were in and out of that hotel um, within six months. Uh, no, nine months, came out in the October. And um, then my dad and mum bought a very famous tea rooms out in Burley in the New Forest called Manor Farm Tea Rooms. Been there many years, I think best part of 100 years. It was an institution. It was a very um, unusual sort of business because of where it was. It was very seasonal. It took 10 times in the summer what it did in the winter. Wow. Um, but it was, a, it was a really great buzz and good place to work. I just helped out in the kitchens there. Were tea uh, rooms a big thing back then? Uh, yeah, I think they were um, – Very much so. And the New Forest is a really great tourist destination. I think um, back then it was better than it is now because Mm -hmm. between Easter and October, it was pretty much flat out all the way through. Whereas now tourism in England, is very there's more peaks and troughs in it. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have a few quieter times mixed in. The winters, I guess, are still pretty quiet, much the same. Is the tea room still there in Burley? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Still called the same thing? Yeah. Manor Farm Tea Rooms, yeah. And um, it's a thatched place, beautiful place, you know. It was good. While we were there, I um, picked up the local paper and saw that Bournemouth College were advertising um, a sandwich course, an open sandwich course. It was six weeks. And I just thought I'd go down there, learn it, because it would help out the parents in the tea rooms and, and, you know, maybe come up with some new ideas and stuff. So I went down to college, bumped into one of the chefs, and he said, what do you want to mess around doing a sandwich course for? Why don't you become a chef? So I said, all right, then, what have I got to do? So he said, I'll arrange an interview for you and uh, we'll see what we can do. I was very fortunate that this particular chap carried out my interview because in those days you needed, co- um, you needed exams to um, get onto these courses. And I left school without any exams. Um, but 
I had an interview with this guy, Peter Albrick, an amazing chef. And um, I guess I just talked my way in. I, I, I told him I'd work really hard and that I wouldn't let him down. And I appreciated the fact that he was giving me an opportunity. And um, he put me on a course which is renowned all over the country. It's an amazing course. In those days, it was called the Hotel Chefs. Nowadays, it's called the Specialised Chefs. And basically, it's a group of students that do a year at college, working and learning from amazing chefs. At Bournemouth College, I don't know about now, but certainly then it was one of the best in the country, if not the best. It was incredible. So you did a year at college learning from those guys, and then you went off for six months to top hotels around the country. Most of them were in London. Um, and you worked in Michelin star places, or top, top places. So it was an amazing opportunity. And then you went back to college for six months and um, to finish up. And if you did well on your work placement, you got invited back to, you generally got invited back to where you worked. And that's what happened to me. I went to, um, I worked for an amazing chef in London called Peter Kronberg at the Intercontinental. It was a Michelin star place. And um, he was one of the great hotel chefs. And um, he had me back after my college. Um, what was it like working in the hotels? Uh, it was hardcore. It was, you know, it was tough. It was, um, pressure was relentless. I got, I got by on adrenaline and a fear of failure, if I'm honest. Um, I loved it. I loved it. But it was it was really tough. You know, I went back there in 1982. I was earning 56 quid a week. I was living in the YMCA. My rent was 36 quid a week. I was coming home because after, the, um, after I finished those two years at college, my lecturers persuaded me to do the Advanced City and Guilds. It was called the 7063. It was a fantastic course and it was day release every Friday. So when I went back to London, I was coming home every Friday and generally a Thursday. And one of my days off was spent learning at college. But that course was incredible. I learned so much. I was a bit out of my depth on the academic side of things. But practically, I really learned a lot on that course. It was un unbelievable. So I was going backwards and forwards to um, London Effectively, because I was doing the college, I was working effectively six days a week. It was difficult because I was with Carolyn. So having a relationship with somebody who lived, you know, 100 miles away, it was tough. And we didn't have mobile phones and stuff. You know, you, I walked out the YMCA and found a payphone outside. That's how we used to talk. But to some degree, um, you must have been pretty independent to be down there, well, in London, doing that sort of thing. At, that, at such a young age as well, your parents are sort of, well, not that young. <sighs> well, but you could say that, and it does seem like that, but... It wasn't that side of things away from work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Living in London and right in the centre of London. I mean, the YMCA is at the end of Oxford. Street. It was. It's not the YMCA now. It's a hotel, but it was just at the end of Oxford Street. And you're right in the centre of London. It sounds amazing, mm -hmm. but it's not amazing if you haven't got any money. Yeah, and it's a lonely place. And without what we got today, you know, smartphones and stuff like that, where you can keep in touch with people, it's difficult. And you know. So I was using pay phones, but I didn't have much money. Mm. And um, so Carolyn and I, we, <laughs> sounds very old fashioned today, we were writing letters to each other, mm. you know? And um, so, uh, yeah, it was good. It was, it was hard, but I mean, looking back, most of my mates were in the building industry. They were earning three or four times what I was earning. Mm -hmm. They had evenings off, weekends off and this, that, and the other. But I loved what I was doing. And I had ambitions to work for myself one day. And because of my limitations at school, this was my chance, yep. you know. And so I wasn't so much focused on um, what I was earning. I was, think I was more focused on what I was learning because one day it could 
it helped me out, you know. So do you not regret not going back and doing the open sandwich course? No, I don't, funny enough. And, uh, you know, look, I feel very lucky and blessed that a few times in my life an opportunity has arisen that at the time you don't know it's an opportunity. Mm. And when that chef turned around to me and steered me onto uh, learning to become, you know, learning chefing, that was an incredible opportunity. I didn't realise it at the time, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I've been lucky. So you, at the time you were still in college, or well, not so much college, but work placement essentially. Um, yeah. How did you then, how did you then get into fish and chips? Explain us that little bit of the journey. Well, when I was home doing my um, um, sitting guilds course one day, my dad was looking at doing a project, um, another, <clears throat> another tea rooms. And um, we went to a place called Lindhurst in the New Forest and met up with this shop fitter by the name of Leslie Atkins uh, and uh, to discuss the cost with him. And we were just sat having a cup of tea with him and um, to cut a long story short, that project wasn't going to be a goer. And uh, so we were just talking generally and out of the blue, he said to us, um, have you ever thought about fish and chips? We said, no. Why is that? He said, well... I'm fitting out a chain of shops in Surrey uh, called Superfish. And they seem to be doing incredibly well. You know, it's great business. And, you know, with your catering experience, it might be an idea to go and have a look at it. So with that, Dad and I jumped in the car and went up to uh, a place called Yule in Surrey, uh, where Superfish had one of their stores. <clears throat> and um, we went there, met up with Michael, the owner, He's a great guy. He's very welcoming to us, and you know, you know, um, Michael Rhodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. To be fair, I haven't seen him for a long time, but he was. He's. I don't forget how nice he was to us when we went there. And um, we had fish and chips. Sat in this place. It was a bit jaw dropping because it was busy. It was fantastic. We got back in the car, and I said to me, Dad, Dad, this is it. I'm a chef. This will be a walk in the park. <laughs> Yes, exactly, Stel. That was my first big mistake. And um, it wasn't easy, but my dad then decided, yeah, let's do it. So he bought a shop and we, you know, got ready to open that. And in those days, um, my dad used to shout from the rooftops about how great something was going to be before it even opened. And um, it was a massive mistake. So we opened this shop in, I think it was December 1983. And um, from a standing start, we took two and a half grand in the first week, which don't sound a lot of money, but fish and chips was 75p. It was 50p for the cod and 25 for the chips. So we got hammered and we screwed it up massively. You know, In what way? Have, well, I didn't have a clue. I mean, I thought the product was okay, mm -hmm. um, but... There's a lot more to it than that, as we all know. And, um, you know, I was cooking sausages to order and people were coming and saying, what's going on here? They'd never seen anything <laughs> like this before. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so, you know, from that start, starting turnover, which was amazing, you know, I think within six months we were down to about £900 a week. And then it was a tough learning curve. For the, Did it ever recover even after? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We built it back up, mm -hmm. but it took, took a few years. Yeah. And... Well, we were only there three years, but it, it, it was, that's where I learned a lot about, you know, I was tinkering with the products. I mean, the one, even though I say we went in there clueless, the one benefit that I had when it came to the product was that because I understood a bit about science of cooking, I could, um, you know, when things didn't come out how I wanted them, mm -hmm. I could tweak them a bit and I had a bit of knowledge to work that out. And, um, so I did that, but got it massively wrong at the beginning, that is for sure. So one question I've got, and I know it's a little bit out of sync, but what did your tutors say about you wanting to leave a respectable, what's, what, what was seen as a respectable chefing career to and go into fish and chips? <laughs> yeah. My lead tutor is a, a, a wonderful man called David Boland, and... Um, his reaction when he found out I was leaving Peter Cromberg in London to go into fish and chips was quite predictable. 
he said, you want your ass kicking, leaving that restaurant to go into fish and chips. I didn't respond, you know, I, was, I had too much respect for him and stuff, but... Was there an element that thought maybe he was right or were you still like full on with what well, you wanted? Well, of course, I didn't know. But my view was it doesn't matter what you're cooking. Mm-hmm. If you do a great job at it, you can please people. And for me, hospitality and um, cooking and all that is all about putting smiles on people's faces. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what you cook. I mean, he thinks differently now. I mean, last Tuesday, I took him out for lunch to a very nice restaurant and we had a blowout lunch and we had a laugh. And so I stay in touch with him. Yeah. And um, he's retired now. He taught Sophie, my daughter, um, a few years ago before he retired. And, you know, I've got nothing but respect for him. And I understood why he said that, that I was mad leaving London. As it turns out, I don't think I was. Mm. And, you know, I remember a chap, um, who was the senior sous chef at the Intercontinental, a guy by the name of David Dorricott, who went on to be the head chef at the House of Commons. And um, I remember him turning around to me when I handed him a notice and he said, do you know what, I'd do the same thing. If I had the chance to work in my own family business, i get it. Mm. So different people had different views as mm. to what, you know, what it was about. That's fair. Well, and also I think fish and chip as an industry has probably moved on since then as well. So I wouldn't imagine that view still exists. I don't know still. I think it probably still would. I think, I, I mean, I, I, the thing is I, I was doing well um, when I was in London and the, um, Peter Cromberg was disappointed. Mm. Um, it didn't go beyond that because it's, it's not that sort of, yeah. yeah. But I did have, I, I'm quite confident that I would have had a good future had I mm. stayed up there, but it wasn't what I wanted for me long term. Mm. You know, as I say, I was with Carolyn to go full on into that industry and say you're going to um, dedicate your life to it. It would have screwed my private life up for sure. Mm. Well, you had to make a personal decision then, didn't you? Yeah. So, yeah. so then moving forward, 1980, no, 1988, you uh, then started your own fish and chip shop completely on your own. Yeah. Um, so dad sold his shop and then the following year, um, I, um, well, he, dad found a shop for me, little shop in Christchurch. I wanted to do my own thing with Carolyn. Uh, we wanted our own fish and ship shop. I felt I'd done tinker with the product and we could hit the ground running if we did a new shop. Um, there was a little shop in Christchurch uh, that was selling fruit and veg. It was up for sale uh, for three and a half thousand quid it already had the planning permission, which was an, a massive stroke of luck. So um, dad bought it for me and, and uh, we, this was 1988. It was the days when you could, you know, walk in a bank and get what you wanted. Mm. And Carolyn and I, we had our own house, but we had very little equity in there. Yeah, I walked into Barclays Bank and saw my manager, Teresa, and um, half an hour later came out with 28 grand to refit this little shop, the fish and chip shop. And um, it was so easy then, Mm. you know. um, To get a loan. Yeah, the banks were giving money away. This was before the crash. You know, this was like, you know, how much do you want? It was like going in and buying a bag of sweets. You just you just went in. I didn't have a business plan or anything. I just talked to her. Wow. She said, what's it going to be called? I said, well, my <laughs> dad's come up with a name, Shay Fred. And she fell about laughing. So she gave us the money um, for the shop, which was fantastic to get the support. Um, and that was it. You know, we went about getting the shop sorted out and getting it ready for opening. And where, where did your dad get the name from? Well, when I was um, training up in London, um, there was an amazing chef. He was a Greek chef, funnily enough, called Nico Ladenis. And uh, he was a self-taught guy, amazing chef. And his main restaurant was called Shea Nico. And I used to talk about it a lot when I was at home. And um, my dad just came up with it out of that. And he said to me, you know, he said, I've got a name for your new shop. So I said, what's that? So he said, Shay Fred. And again, we just giggled, you know, and, and, and when we, um, the more people we told it to, they all sort of laughed and got it. It was a fun name. Mm. 
So, and actually when I look back, I think it is a big part of our success. So it's been a very, it's been a good name for us for sure. And um, so when did you open Shea Fred in Christchurch? So we opened on April Fool's Day, um, 1988. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a good time to open because it was right at the start of the season. Mm -hmm. And um, we were busy from day one. It went very well. Um, it was a takeaway, but in the waiting area, we had three tables of four. And um, those we it wasn't a restaurant, but we ran it like a restaurant. Okay. So it was table service, and um, those tables were full all the time. Did you manage to learn... Well, did you manage to sort of like correct a lot of the errors that you'd made previously before you went into this shop? Oh, yeah, massively. Yeah. You learn as you go along, don't you? Mm. I mean, you know, you're always learning, but uh, we started there with a lot more confidence about what we were doing and consequently didn't upset people. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and what was the, one of the big things that you noticed running this shop? Well, the biggest thing was that when we had these three tables um, in the restaurant, we realised that that is the way that people given a choice would love to eat their fish and chips out of a fryer onto a plate. So that sets about searching for a site um, that we could do um, with more seats. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how our shop in Westbourne came about. It had been for sale for quite some time. Um, it... It had been a fish and chip shop since 1968. It was all orange and brown for mica. It hadn't had very little money spent on it on the intervening years. And um, so we um, we agreed to buy. It was a lot of money. We bought freehold. And um, the previous owners thought we were lunatics because <laughs> not only were we paying a lot of money for it, but we, shut, we were going to shut it down for six weeks and spend 150000 on it. And... When I look back, um, that was pretty insane because we'd, you know, I'd sold Christchurch, so I got the deposit for that. Uh, I went in 50-50 with my dad on Westbourne, but we borrowed shed loads of money. This was when interest rates were 15% and we were borrowing money at three over base. So we were borrowing money at 18%, borrowing most of it on a site where we needed to treble the turnover to break even. Um, so two questions I've got, sorry to interrupt you there, yeah. Fred, is A, you had a load of confidence in yourselves, and B... Well, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said it was misguided. I would have said we were lunatics. You know, we, it, was, it, was, it was... It's interesting because when, I, when you're young, and I was very young then, I was 25, but when you're young, you, um, I, my view was, uh, well, it doesn't matter, Dad. If we screw it up, we'll do it again. Mm. And... As we well know, it's not as easy as that. Yeah. But that's just the way we thought. So we, yeah, we were very gung-ho, to be honest. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, my second point was, a lot of people would not even know what it's like. Well, your generation would, but my generation wouldn't really know what it's like to borrow money at 18%. Yeah, well, it's very tough. I mean, and yeah, I can understand what you're saying there. But then there are different challenges today that we probably didn't have then. You know, mm. in those days, all you had to do was turn up, serve decent fish and chips with decent service, and you took a fortune. Yeah. It's not like that today. You've got to do a lot more. Mm. So there were different, through the generations, there were different challenges. And it just so happened that at that time, the main challenge was how much money cost to borrow. But we, there was, um, we had a, a chap, Peter, um, who had been a customer of ours since uh, starting my dad's shop. And he was an incredible man, a lovely man. He'd done very well in his life and used to fund various projects privately. And he came to us out of the blue one day and said, look, let me take Barclays Bank out of the equation for you and I'll lend you the money at base rate. So even though it was still expensive, mm -hmm. it was an absolute no-brainer because yeah. um, we were saving 3% immediately and we we really liked this chap. We mm. might have been naive, you know, maybe we didn't know what he was like in business, but as it turns out, he was a, like the gentleman of all gentlemen. He mm. was just an amazing man. And um, so he took out Barclays Bank and... How know, long after you opened would he have come along? It was in the first year. Oh, okay. And, you know, he, when I look back, 
and my life. Uh, I, I, I've met a few people that have been game changers for me. And Peter, you know, was around for most of my business life and I sadly passed away about four years ago. Um, but I'll never forget what he did for us in terms of supporting us. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, amazing guy. So you were the cook. Yeah. And your dad was the host. That's right. Dad was the front man. He's never cooked anything in his life. And, and I don't believe that. Are you trying to tell me that he didn't fry fish once? He's never f- a fish. No chance. He ain't even fried a chip. <laughs> but it, dad's a people person. He yeah. was brought up. My nan and granddad had uh, pubs and conservative clubs during the, you know, um, when my dad was a boy. And from the age of eight, he was behind a bar talking to people. So he's very good at um, um, talking to people and, you know, gets away with murder. You know, tact is not my dad's middle name. You no. know, we'd have, we'd have three individuals um, waiting in the queue at Westbourne. And they wouldn't know it when they're being brought to the table, but by the time they got there, they'd realise that they're all being sat together and they've never met each other before. <laughs> that's what my dad was like. I mean, you couldn't get away with that today, but that's what it was like in those days. Do you reckon, like, after that experience, people made good friends, being forced on the table together? Uh, yeah, they did. I mean, we've got some great stories. I mean, one in particular stands out. We had um, um, a couple, a lady and a guy, um, Mike and June, who used to come in every Tuesday, singles, just coming every Tuesday. And whilst queuing up, they used to start chatting and then they realised they were in at the same time most weeks. And eventually they started sitting together uh, and enjoying their lunch together. And within a couple of years, they were married. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we had our own sort of blind date wedding. Yeah. I reckon your dad should have at least been their best man, really, shouldn't he? Yeah, he should have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so... Your dad, we'll call him Peter because we don't yeah. keep calling him dad. Yeah. He's not my dad. Um, he gave you a lot of autonomy. What was that like at that age? Like, Well, he- that's what I got the most respect for, for my dad, because, you know, we started this business together as equal partners. But as you know, in any business, it's very difficult if you've got more than one boss. And, you know, I said to dad, you know, I, I think that, you know, I really want to do that. And he didn't stand in my way and supported me. And in spite of the fact that because of my age and because of our inexperience as a family, we were still really inexperienced. I was making shed loads of mistakes and he never gave me a hard time for that. And when I look back, there's no doubt that that development at such a young age really was good for me. Yeah. You know, it was amazing. So, yeah. He wasn't wasn't one to dwell on your mistakes then. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, you know, he's, he's always been very supportive and, you know, he's, he's incredibly proud of what we built together and um, also how it's blossomed since he retired. Mm. Yeah, when I, when I come to the restaurant and I see your dad sitting there with Johnny, I must admit, at first, I, I was never offended, but he always used to make fun of me. But then I realised that right. it runs in the DNA of the Capels, I think. He's yeah. like that... Um, not that he is one, but he's got that, uh, like, the lovable rogue about him, hasn't he? Like, yeah, a little yeah. bit, yeah. 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 So then, not not just, like, instantly, but in 1991, you won Fish and Chips of the Year. And um, so give us a little bit of background information, like how many times you entered and, you know, and how, how did that work? Well, the competition started in 1988 and um, it was completely out of the blue. And the first shop that won it, was a shop called Toffs in Muswell Hill in North London. A great shop. Yeah, great shop. And um, lovely family. It was a great shop. And um, it was like, wow. I mean, these guys, they were on Wogan on TV and millions upon millions of people saw that. The publicity was off the charts. And we were looking at that and I just thought, we've got to be a part of that. The first year we opened, we weren't ready for that. We, we, you know, we were so busy. We just opened the doors and we were, you know. Rock. But it was on your radar. Uh, I can't remember, okay. to be honest. And the first year, I just, I, we, all we were concentrating on was serving and looking after our customers. Mm. The second year, uh, 1990, was the first year we entered. Um, and um, we won our region, got into the final, and uh, we came runner-up. 
with everyone else. Uh, Ashvale won it that year. Great guys, great shop, deserving winners. Um, and we were in the pile behind. And um, but it was a good learning experience, you know. I did it, and then the following year, we entered again, and we were lucky. We won it. So, so what impresses me about that a little story is that how how it was really popular from day one. You know, getting on Wogan, getting on TV, the radio. I, I thought that maybe it would ramp up differently, but you know. Well, I think you're looking. You know, you're looking at a product that's been around best part of 130 years mm. and didn't have any. You know, there wasn't anything that could recognise great shops up and down the country. It was a new thing. So, and, and do you think customers reacted positively to it? Oh, that, wow, yeah. yeah. Because they would have been so used to fish and chips, or it's just fish and chips, yeah. you know. But now all of a sudden, it's the best fish oh, and chips. Oh, it's chip. fantastic, yeah. you know. And I guess in those days, I mean, bear in mind, you know, there's a lot of competitions mm. now within the fish and chip awards, but in those days, it was just fish and chip shop of the year. So, all of the energy in terms of media and stuff went through that. Mm. Now, that obviously still had limitations because there was no social media or anything like that. It was literally TV, radio and newspapers. I mean, the week we won it, we were in the news of the world that Sunday and on the front of the news of the world, it used to have how many copies they'd printed that mm. and it was f nearly 5 million copies. Wow. So, yeah, it was, the publicity was, you know, good. So, in 1991, you were the fourth fish and chip shop in the UK to win it. Were we? Yeah, yeah, I guess we were. So yeah. your fourth yeah. one, yeah, because um, you were after Ashvale. Yeah, that's right. And um, so, what was it like coming back to Bournemouth, like after winning like that? Well, it was amazing. I mean, I got lots of regrets about the awards because um, I've got no photographs. I got one photograph, uh, which is a sea fish media shot, and I got a couple of medals and a plaque. And you know, I'm really envious when I look today at how how the coverage of the winners is covered. You know, everyone's got smartphones, you get videos and photographs and all that. I wish I had more of a memory of what happened on that day because um, all I remember was it was a magic day. You know, we, it, was, it was fantastic. Coming back to Bournemouth, it was um, special. Um, in those days, the competition was different. The final was held in mid-November rather than in January. So pretty much your winning year went over into the following year. Mm -hmm. So we won it in 91, but there was only a month of that left. So your winning year becomes 92. And, um, you know, it massively affected trade. Basically, winter became summer, which in Bournemouth is, is, means, you know, we were very busy. Mm. And, and what was it like with customers? Did they have really high expectations? Or, well, I suppose your regular customers knew what they were getting anyway, but what about, you know, new customers? A lot of people that have won the award since. Well, I think that's one of the, one of the things with the award. It's, mm. it's great winning it, but your customer expectation does go up. Yeah. So you've got to deliver. And, but yeah, no, it was great. You know, it was, uh, it was fantastic. It was great buzz. It was, you know, it's good for the team and all that sort of stuff. It's a long, long time ago still. You know, we're talking the best part of 30 years ago now. And, so it's difficult for me to remember mm. exactly what it was like. But you're still a, a, a big fan of the whole Seafish Awards and you do encourage others to, to enter. So what, what advice would you give anyone who wants to enter? I think it's, uh, I mean, I know it's got its critics and um, it's not a perfect, it never, nothing's ever perfect. No. But if I had to look over the last 30 years at what I think has um, contributed the most to a lifting of standards in our industry, it all goes back to the awards. Yeah. So for me, they've been a fantastic thing in driving standards um, in our industry through people getting feedback and improving what they do and looking at what other award winners do and emulating them. And I, I can't see a negative. I, I suppose... The fact that you didn't win on year three, or at least your first time entering. Yeah. The fact is that you came back and you looked at your practices and so on, and you honed your skills, let's say, whatever it is that you well, felt. Well, yeah, I just needed to be better in the room, to be fair. Mm. Um, that said, you know, in the year we won, I still screwed it up. Yeah. I remember going into the room. And in those days, I mean, th these days, most people go in in couples. There are some people going on their own, but in those days, it was just one person generally went in oh, from really? the shop. Yeah, yeah. And I went in on my own and I started my presentation and after half a minute, I just lost my track and I just turned around and said, I'm really sorry, can I start again? Mm. And they all said, yeah. 
Nice. And that was the year we won it. So you can still screw it up and win it, you know? But you, well, you could in those days, whether you can today or not, I don't know. As an entrant, though, you've got to be not happy, but pretty okay with a bit of personal critique, you know, because people are going to pick apart your business or yourself in that environment, aren't they? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think I, I've, I've never had a problem um, being critical about myself, you know, the problem when you work for yourself is you don't have a boss, so you've got to kick yourself up the ass. Yeah. So if you can't do that, you're losing out. You know, you've got to be able to look at yourself and say, yeah, I've got it wrong. Well, I think it makes the big, yeah, I think that's so true. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, you then started a franchise. So, yeah. well, you know, what, what led you to that conclusion? How did you get to that point? Well, my dad had a, a friend who used to come in the shop who had done very well in his life. He, he was kind of retired, but he kept on it with dad, badgering him and said, you know, you should really look at franchising this business, a fantastic business, you know, and uh, to roll this out would be would be a, you know, really good thing. Um, I guess there was an element of that we believed in our own success and also I won't, you know, even though my motivating factor then and still today isn't money. It's all my, you know, my, my, the way I look at it is do a great job. And if you do a great job, the rewards will come. The fact is when somebody talks about franchising, the rewards can be so enormous so quickly mm-hmm. that you just think, yeah, this could be good. I suppose in the 90s, the word franchise was all the rage, I suppose. Yeah, it was. Mm. Yeah, it was. And... um um it so we well, we decided to take the plunge and that chap put together a team of guys uh from you know various sort of experts that you need in franchising um but you can't just look at franchising i mean in month 1 we allocated 45,000 quid to the setup and it carried on from there and we spent a lot of money wow and um but yeah. Is that was, before you even did physical things? Like, was it like contracts and things like that? Or? You need franchise agreements. You, uh, we had to pay an upfront fee to the guy that was going to lead the team. And um, it was just, yeah, it's, you can't look at that. Look, I, this was a very dark period in our time. I didn't mm. enjoy those couple of years. And um, I'll go into why we screwed it up. But um, I, I certainly think every bit of failure associated with our time in franchising wasn't down to the people that we picked it was down to our naivety as a family Mm. and um yeah so we you know we hold the blame for it not working out for sure you don't blame any of those guys you you seem quite chilled about that oh well i certainly weren't chilled at the time you know it was it was they were desperate times for us uh towards the end but it was, um, uh, no, I don't think you go about blaming people. You know, we, we took them on. Yeah. I got it wrong. It was down to extreme naivety on our part. I mean, the biggest problem we had, you know, you, you want to lo- launch franchise business and you've got one successful shop. Not only have we got one successful shop, but just one fish and chip shop a year. So when you're trying to sell a franchise to people, they're turning around and saying, well, yeah, of course it's successful. Mm. You just won fish and chip shop of the year. Yeah. The fact that we were really successful before that, the shop was really busy before that, didn't come into it. So our biggest failing at that time was thinking you could launch franchise business from a platform of one good shop. So did you then go on and do another shop? Yeah, we did. But I mean, just going back, my belief now, as it was after we did the franchise, is that you can't launch a successful franchise business until you've proven it on a company basis Mm. across a minimum of three or four stores in different sites, you know, then you've got something that is franchisable if it's, if it's, you know, great and consistent across that. But what we did was we realized after months of trying to land a franchise that it wasn't going to happen. So we thought we'd have to open another company store well away. Um, To do that, we thought of London. And in those days, the, the top agents for finding restaurant properties in in and around London were a company called Davis and Coffer, headed by a chap who's an absolute legend by the name of David Coffer. And what he doesn't know about restaurant property isn't worth knowing. So as a group of directors, we went up to his offices in Mayfair and sat in his office and um, handed him our franchise prospectus. 
he spent a few minutes looking at it, lifted his head up, and I'll never forget what he said. Nice business. Why do you want to ruin it? <laughs> now, my dad and the other directors were quite offended by that because, you know, they thought, you know, who's he? We can mm. walk on water. Well, actually, that's not the case. That was the first moment when I actually thought to myself, my God, if he's saying that, I'm barking up the wrong tree here. Mm. Should we really be going down this route? Because this guy is, you know, he knows what he's talking about. But I guess, the, again, down to naivety, you think to yourself, oh, I've already spent a load of money. Might as, well, right. might as well go ahead with it. And that's what we did. It's fair to say he had nothing to gain from putting you guys off. No, he didn't. No. It, but we were, you know, we were just very naive. Mm. And so we decided to proceed with it. And he found us a site um, in Golders Green uh, to open um, the first Shea Fred away from our area. And we, um, we fitted it out, beautiful shop. Um, the shop fitters that recently did Shea Fred, they did that shop back in 1993. And um, um, we opened it. I can't remember when we opened it in 1993, but it was sometime that year we opened it. And um, that was it. But I walked in it. And despite the fact that it was a beautiful shop fit, I didn't like it. Mm. Why is that? What, 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 what didn't you like? Well, I realised we were heading for a car crash, so my heart wasn't in it. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the other thing is, um, despite the fact that it was a beautiful shop, it was soulless. It didn't have any soul. It was, it was, it was very, uh, you know, that, that, that comes from the people. And when you've got a group of people that are headed by me mm-hmm. that don't really want to be there... Mm. It just, you know, it was relatively successful because it was a great site, but yeah. um, the, my heart wasn't in it. And um, I just, to be honest, I wanted to pack the whole thing in and go back to Bournemouth and get <laughs> back to my own shop. Um, Dad and I were only involved in that business for about six months, I'm guessing, but it was around six months. We then came out of it. The other partners decided to um, carry on with it um, and I don't know when, probably about a year later, it went under, it, it closed up. Um, it, all of us lost a lot of money. So the franchising was a very painful experience. So out of this whole negative experience, was, were there any positives? Yeah, there was, but it was... I mean, there wasn't any positives of... Um, no uh, obvious ones, let's say. Like, Yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't any positives out of um, Gold is Green apart from experience yeah. in terms of, you know, it's kind of what not to do. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess the best thing there is at a young age, I learned a massive lesson. And But the thing is, you know, we went back to... Um, Westbourne, there was another amazing... Um, uh, thing that came out of franchising, but I'll get onto that in a minute. But we went back to Westbourne um, to lick our wounds, and you know that experience was virtually catastrophic mm. for what we had. Did you our- lose trade at Westbourne? Or well, we took our eye off the ball. Mm. We were still very busy, but we didn't have any money. And it's like anything, isn't it? It's, it doesn't matter how much more money you got coming in if you got more going out you've got a problem yeah and because we'd screwed it up so badly and lost so much money we were in trouble and we were in so much trouble in fact pete our funder his advisors the solicitors and accountants um they advised him to call in the loan did he no he didn't which is an absolute massive piece of luck because had we been with a bank at that time, had we stuck with the bank, mm. they wouldn't have had any hesitation in pulling the rug on us because we were in dire straits, we were in trouble. And this was at a time after the crash when mm. banks were incredibly nervous. So, yeah, lucky break that we were with Pete and he looked after us, you know, and he turned round to his advisors and said, I get what you're saying, but I've got faith in these guys mm. to turn it round and I'm going to stick with them. You mentioned something amazing came from the franchise. So what was it? Uh, It was a meeting, um, a guy that changed my life, to be honest. Um, 
So I got a phone call out of the blue from a chap called Anthony Lyons who worked for David Coffer in London at the agency. He was an amazing guy. And Anthony said to me, Fred, have you ever heard of a chap called Ian Neal? So I said, no, why is that? Who, who's that? And he said, um, well, he was um, involved in Pizza Express and was the driving force behind its formative years. He was a director and general manager of Pizza Express when it started out. And uh, also he was a managing director of Rank Restaurants, um, which had Prima Pasta and Sweeney Todd's and one or two other brands. So he's incredible, you know, he's an incredible guy. And he's phoned me up to ask me about you guys because he's interested in a franchise. And um, he's from Leeds, he loves fish and chips, and he wants to talk to you. So I said, great, can you put us together? So I met up with Ian, and due to his experience, obviously, he realised that this upstart, as in me, was Mm -hmm. never going to make a go of this franchising business. But I think he liked what we was doing and and the way we were trying, and he, he stayed on as kind of an advisor and helped me actually get out of it. And so this was whilst you were still involved with the franchise? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he came, you know, when we opened Golders Green, he came to that and um, he loved what he saw. But he just he just knew that infrastructure-wise, we were never... It was doomed, yeah. It was never going to... And, and, and obviously, by that time, I knew it was as mm. well. So I tapped into his knowledge and worth of experience on how to get out of it. And um, he helped me massively. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, 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 I mean, he has become my lifelong mentor Mm. and friend. You know, I spoke to him a few weeks ago. We're going out for a bite to eat in a few weeks time. He's just been an unbelievable help to me. So did you start working with him straight away or? With Ian. No, what happened was, um, the franchising finished. Dad and I go back to Westbourne. Um, to get on with trying to get our business back on track. And um, I get a phone call from Ian and he said, Fred, I'm going to, this is in 1995. He said, I'm going to open a fish and chip shop in Barnet in North London and I want you to have a part of it. It's not going to cost you much money. I'm going to give you a quarter of the business and all I want you to do is come in and, you know, work on the food side of things. And... um, This was at a time when our confidence, I mean, I've got to tell you, you know, not only were we shot to pieces money-wise, but we were on our knees confidence-wise as well. But this is where my dad's amazing. You know, I I thought about it and I turned around to dad and I said, dad, I don't know what you think, but I think this is too good an opportunity to pass up. Mm -hmm. I get to work with this guy. He's a genius. And what I'm going to learn out of it is just going to be incredible, you know. And he agreed and he said, yeah, you've got to do it. You know, don't, don't even think about it. We've got to do it. You know, it's not going to take up too much of your time, sort of a, a day, day and a half a week away from the shop. So we can cope with that. I oh, see. So you didn't have to be gone for long periods of time. No, 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 no. I, I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure that when we first opened, I was up there for a couple of weeks nonstop, you know, mm-hmm. stayed up there. But after that, it was very much part time. Mm. Um, Ian obviously did everything. You know, he, he they got this place designed and, and built. Um, on the back of what we did at Golders Green, he looked at that and he actually used our, our shop fitters down in Bournemouth to okay. do this restaurant, um, which, was a, which was a game changer for him because he'd always used builders, separate builders in the past. And um, so he got it together. And in terms of running restaurants, there wasn't anything I could teach Ian. Mm. He was like, you know, I was the one learning. So um, it was just literally to help out on the food side of things. And it was just incredible working one-to-one with this guy. You know, he built a beautiful restaurant there. Uh, you know, some people thought it was maybe a bit ahead of its time, but I loved it. You know, it was fantastic. And, um, yeah, he was just uh, it's so inspiring to me. So what, what, what happened? Because obviously you're not in that business now. So what, what exactly happened? Well, we were there for about two years when Ian got a call um, um, and it was about him getting involved in a business that had one unit, one restaurant in London called Wagamama. And they wanted him to get in in on it because they wanted to roll it out and create a chain. And 
the rest is history. He uh, became chairman and chief executive of Wagamama. So, so was he like fairly instrumental for what they are now, would you say? He took it from one unit to a hun- in London to 110 units worldwide. Wow. So yeah, it's all down to him. He, I mean, obviously he didn't create the concept, that was Alan Yao, but in terms of the actual driving that and achieving that standard of quality that they did as they grew... That's all down to it. And it was all done under his so, leadership. So would you say it's his work at Wagamama that sort of earned him the nickname the godfather of casual dining, would you say? Not only that, he's been involved in many restaurant concepts, um, household names up and down the country, he'd been directors of lots of different companies over the years and um, has always been in demand in that respect. That's why he's considered the godfather of casual dining. And I think that's a very apt uh, name for him because he is. He is it, what he... The way he puts together teams and can roll out brands is is, is unbelievable. And, and just to clarify, because we were talking about this when we was unloading earlier, you were saying that there was never any pressure on either making it a chain or a franchise. It was just, let's see where it goes. Well, that's the right way of doing it. Yeah. you know. And that's one of the things I learned from Ian. Ian's the sort of guy who said, Fred, let's do one. If it's good, we'll do another one. Mm. It's things like that that I learned from Ian. Yeah. And just to take you back a step, because I pushed you forward a little bit. Yeah. Um, Wagamama or the city or whoever came knocking. Yeah. And then what happened to Whitecaps? So obviously that was going to be a full-time job for Ian. So we had to sell the restaurant Mm. and we didn't sell it um, as a fish and chip shop. It actually got turned into a Mediterranean restaurant, became very successful actually. Um, Because it was a building that the great thing, the smart thing that Ian did um, at the beginning was he built a building that, if you took the range out of it, it would just be a lovely restaurant oh, space. Really? Yeah, so it didn't look like a fish and chip shop. So it was, you know, it had um, it had the ability to be turned into something else. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you sold white caps, and what sort of happened next? Well, went back to work, uh, you know, full on on, on Westbourne um, with Dad. Um, then in 1998, I got a phone call from Pete, our funder, and he said to me, Fred... Chelsea Building Society next door to you is up for sale. You've got to buy it. I said, Pete, I'm too nervous after what we've been through in the last you know, few years. I, I, I just don't want to get into more debt. So he said, right, all right, but I'm going to buy it. And trust me, you will end up buying it from me. So he paid 80000 for the freehold of this shop next door to us. And six months later, we ended, <laughs> we ended up paying 90000 from him. So he was right. And um, I just rented it out. Um, and, but the good thing was that at the back of this shop next door was a yard which was adjacent to the rear part of our restaurant. So a year later, we built a couple of walls out there and put a lid on it, and that extended our restaurant and made it you know, more comfortable. So that was, a, that was in 1999. That was a, wow. that was a, that was a good change for us. So just before we carry on, I just want to point out how, like, that the, you say he's your funder, but this guy must have been pretty, he must have been, he loved you guys. Like, you know, there's no doubt someone puts this much effort in. Just Yeah, but we know. never missed a payment. Yeah. And, you know, we totally respected, you know, him and um, looked after him. And, uh, yeah, he, he was an amazing guy. And when we bought that shop, you know, I didn't have to put anything down. He gave me all the money. Wow. He lent me everything. So I bought it for 90 grand and he lent us 90 grand to have it. So, And in hindsight, it was no brainer. Oh, in hindsight, oh, what a wonderful thing that is. Yeah. It, it's when we did, you know, our recent um, refurbishment. So we bought it in 98. Um, we rented it out. And in 2015 was the end of the lease and that's when we decided to take it back because the original Shea Fred was by that time very tired and tatty and needed a refurb and it just made sense to take the walls out and make it what it always should have been you know uh, uh, a much nicer site so had we not bought that shop initially uh, yeah we wouldn't have been able to do it so you had a refurb was it uh, December 2015 you closed yeah, we closed in oh. December 2015, but the planning for that started a good three years earlier. Um, it's very, um, I wasn't sure whether we wanted to do it mm. because the problem was, even though the old Shea Fred was tired and tatty, it was still doing great numbers. Mm. Every year was busier than the last year. 
And I'd heard many stories from lots of friends and people in the industries related to ours that you can have a great business, rip it all out, spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on it and end up with less than what you had before because mm. people don't like it. Yeah. So I was really nervous about that. The other thing is, you know, um, I am no, I'm not about to get my bus passed, but I'm at a stage in my life where I didn't want to screw something up and start again. Mm. So I was really nervous. Yeah. If I look at how I was when we started Westbourne and how I say, I know we were naive, but it was a bit more gung-ho. You don't get like you. You don't feel like that when you're older. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're very careful not to make um, big mistakes, mm. and um, so yeah, it was. Um, I suppose you, you knew what could go wrong, and you just wanted to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. So I was really, really careful to um, plan it out, get the right designer to do the job. Which is no easy task because designers like a clean sweep. They like mm. to start again. And I wanted, uh, you know, evolution, not revolution. I, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I wanted, pe- I wanted to change everything, but I wanted people to still come in and recognise that it was a Shea Fred. Yeah. So that's a really tough brief for a designer. But, she, you know, the lady I picked is a lady by the name of Claire Wood. She's an incredible designer. And she, she worked with me on it. And we worked on it for over a year. You know, it was fantastic. I had her, the first thing I did was I had her down for the day with an apron on in the restaurant. So she understood about the flows and all that sort of Mm. stuff. And that was probably the best days, you know, best fee I've spent um, because of her understanding of that. Mm. She nailed the um, flows from day one, the layout. It's just like fabulous. And that's what makes it what it is today, I think. And where did you pick up your influence? For the, the refurbishment? Well, my influence has come far and wide and not just from um, hospitality businesses and restaurants, takeaways and stuff. Um, I, you know, um, for example, one of the lights, the main light that I've got at Westbourne, it's a beautiful light. And I was walking um, in a street just off Carnaby Street in London and I saw this barbers and had these lights in the window. And I went in and asked if I could take a photograph of them. And um, I sent them to Claire and I just said, Claire, I love these lights. Any chance we'd have them in the restaurant? She said, they'd be perfect. I think the difference now to years and years and years ago is we've all got smartphones. So when you walk around and you see something you like, just take a photograph of it. I love design. You know, if I'm at home and I'm watching, you know, TV, I'd like watching Grand Design and stuff like that. I love design. So... From my point of view, because I'm interested in it, I put a lot of effort into um, that side of things. And not only did we want to create something that um, people would recognise, but we wanted to create something timeless. I didn't want to be refitting it again six, seven years down the line. Well, one of the things that, you know, chatting to you at the moment is sort of like you, you've always, um, you've always sort of, had a shop fitter and a designer and where many, but well, maybe not always a designer, but you've always had a shop fitter where. No, I have always had a designer as well. Still, yeah. and, and I think that's really quite impressive that your dad probably had one. Well, you said your dad had one for the tea rooms as well. And it's like, not the tea rooms, oh, but his first fish and chip shop he did. Yeah. And I think that's pretty impressive that, you know, you saw people that could do it better than you. It's just a different way of doing it. I mean, I, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't like designers because, you know, some designers charge as a percentage of the job and they think there's an incentive for them to bulk up the price of the job. But that isn't like, that's not how I've ever worked with a designer. I I start off with a designer and agree a fee. And when I look at the percentage of what I spend on the overall cost and how much of that is down to design, which is generally less than 5%, I just think it would be stupid not to do it. So... That's why I have a designer. Um, also, you know, I mean, I remember when we had all the drawings and the layouts for, 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 the, for the new site. And it's very difficult from a piece of paper to get an idea of scale. And it's not until you start to see it coming together that you get an idea about that. And that's where a designer is very, very strong, yeah. you know. And, yeah, she was she she was amazing, but I wouldn't do it without a designer. In terms of shop fitters, I mean, you pay a premium for a shop fitter, but a I think you get it done the job done quicker, and b I generally think you get a better finish. Yep. That's not to say you can't get a great finish if you don't have one, but generally I think you get a better finish. Mm. Ian Neal, for example, 
in his Pizza Express days and all those days, they used to use builders. Yeah. When he saw what we put together at Golders Green, he wanted to do his next restaurant, which was our restaurant that we did together in Barnet, using the same fit shop fitter that we had at, um, um, at Golders Green. Mm. He saw that and he thought, wow, that is like, I want to do that. That's a fantastic finish. Yeah. And in fact, you know, that was my shop fitters down in Bournemouth who did much, uh, redid Shaford recently, and they did very well out of that, mm. um, getting together with Ian because they ended up doing shed loads of Wagamamas for him. Oh, wow. And Ian loved going that route. So I think he, you know, I think he saw that and he thought, yeah, that's a good way of going. And he went that way. So if I, and, you know, when we did Shaford at Westbourne again the, for, you know, three years ago, when I say it was gutted, we're talking drains, mm. water supplies, everything. I mean, it was absolutely gutted. And from closing the old store to reopening, it was nine weeks. Wow. That's incredible. When you look at the amount of work that took place and you need an inc- amazing team for that. And yeah, there's a premium, probably paid 25, 30% more to get that done that way. But there's a reason why these guys do all the top restaurants in London. Well, know? at least it wasn't another nine weeks added to the build as well. Yeah. But, you know, that, that would have been pretty frustrating for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, you know, we paid all the staff while we were closed. And so you've got massive expenses when you're closed and you've got nothing coming in. Mm. You need to have a great deal of faith in the people that are putting it back together that they're going to be on time. Yeah. So, and, and if we fast forward to today, 2019, um, the business looks very different. Well, not very different. You're still there, but your dad's retired. Yeah. Um, your mum helps out a little bit. But tell us a little bit about the management team today and well, also the, all, the, all the team. Well, Dad retired back in um, 2001, so um, he's had a good retirement. You know, he's enjoying that. My mum, my mum looks after the flowers, you know, and um, when we was in the fruit business, she was an interflora florist, so she was a very good florist at that. And ever since we've had the shop, every single week, we put fresh flowers on the table and they mm. change every week. And um, she does that. She does a great job at it. I mean, one day she'll want to retire from that, obviously. And Sophie doesn't know it yet, but she'll probably be picking that up. <laughs> I'm sure she can't wait to hear yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So um, that's mum and dad um, of family. Um, Carolyn, she's worked in a business from day one. I mean... She, bless her, doesn't get any of the credit for what's happened there, but she deserves a massive amount of um, respect for the efforts that she's put in over the years. And she's been a fundamental part of our success over the years. Um, Just because she's in the background, it doesn't get noticed so much. Mm. But, you know, she runs the restaurant on a Friday and Saturday night. Um, She does all the wages and lots of behind the scenes stuff. And she brought up two amazing kids while I wasn't around, you mm. know. And that's a, you know, that's a big regret of mine. You know, you and I, when we, in the past, we've spoken about um, a, mu- a mutual friend of ours, Mark, Mark Petru. Um, and one of the things I admire most about Mark is, yes, he built a great business, but um, he also was a great dad and a great husband during that time. And uh, if I'm honest, I was a bit of a failure at that. You know, it was all about the shop and the business and this, that and the other. And um, so, yeah, probably if I had my time over again, I'd do things a bit differently in that respect. But so Carolyn's been a f- great part of our success. Um, Tom, my boy, he's worked for us since he was 13. Never went out and got another job which can sometimes be a bit, you know, a bit of a risk because sometimes young people need to go out and find out what it's like outside of a family business before they can perform in a family business. But he's not been like that. He's put incredible effort in. He's now pretty much running the place. And there's echoes of me and my dad, really, in terms of I want to step back a bit. And, you know, we were chatting in the car on the way back from football just before Christmas and he said to me, Dad, I'm, I think I'm ready to step up and you need to take a bit more time off, which is great for me, you know, me and... Did it, you need it, asking twice or telling twice in this uh, instance? I won't, no, <laughs> but it's difficult because I love going to work and mm. I love frying and I don't do a lot. 
I don't do setups and I don't do close downs, but I love the bit in the middle. Yeah, you know? like that time when I rang you because someone's Kremco range buzzer was going off and you told me to call Tom. Yes, well, I don't know how to switch the thing on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know uh, how to open and lock the door. Too, I'm too old to learn now as well. <laughs> it makes complete sense. Yeah. And, and Sophie's now in the business as well. Yeah, well, Sophie did the, um, she did the same course as me and, in fact, was very lucky to be taught by the same people as me just before they retired. That was fantastic because she then went to London for five years, worked at amazing Michelin star restaurants. She's a great little chef. And, um, but she also is good with people. She likes working on the people side of the business. And, um, so she's working between, she came back just over a year ago and she's working between the takeaway and the restaurant. And we love having her back. It's great. I mean, we're quite lucky at times all four of us are there. And I know the place is not massive, it's not a big shop, but it's not a small shop. So we can easily get a bit of space around each other and you're not on each other's toes all the time, you know. So um, I absolutely love just standing there sometimes and looking around and seeing all of my lot together, you know. Um, but we're, we're really blessed because as well as my immediate family, I've got a wider family of the team that work with us and... They are the magic that happens in our place. They are the reason that um, we continue to improve our business year in, year out. You know, we've got the best part. It ranges for between 40 and 50 staff, but every single one of them, I mean, uh, it's incredible, you know, the way they, um, the, the effort they put in. And how would you say, how would you say you have evolved as an employer over the years? Well, I've changed dramatically. I mean, obviously because of the way I was brought up in London in terms of my training, it was quite a harsh environment. It's just the way Sheffield was back then. And um, so I didn't know any better. So I was a little bit, you know, it's my way or the highway when I started working with dad. And um, the problem is good people take the highway Mm. and you've got to learn quick. And I did learn quickly because that's a painful experience. And Ian obviously taught me that, you know, one of the things that happens when you do a great number of restaurants is you can't do it without fantastic people. And it's all about, you know, what you get out of those people depends on how you treat them. Mm. So, I um, have changed a lot. So that's one side of me. Another side of me is I've got, if I see something going wrong, there's a process that happens within a second in my head. And that is, I ask myself, if what I've seen wrong, is it business threatening? If it's not, I pretend I haven't seen it and I walk Mm -hmm. away. You can be on people's backs too much. And, you know, all of us, you know, in our industry, we've all got high standards and we all want the best for our businesses and all the rest of it. But you just can't be on people's backs all the time. No. So my, my, the way I look at it, it's a split second decision when I see something. If it's not business threatening, I let it go. I pretend I haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. If it is, I'll deal with it. Yeah, that's really good. It's good that you, you reflect on that as well. Because, yeah. Well, you learn by, you learn by your mistakes in lifestyle. And I... Um, I wouldn't have the team I've got around me if if I was that guy that left London and had those ways of dealing with people because they were they weren't right. And it, 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 Ian was a massive help in that, you know, in, in polishing my rough edges. Yeah. Well, uh, well, moving on slightly, one, one thing that impresses me that you're one of the few restaurants takeaways in the country that even in January when it's sort of flat out there you're still busy, you know, and especially at lunchtime, for example. And, I, you know, I'll sit there at the bar while I'm typing away an email and, and it surprises me as to why you're so busy. And what would you sort of put that down to? Is that, was that something that's just designed overnight? It's a difficult question because there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, I think one of the things is that we've always been, we've been in it for the long term. And I think the longer you're in it and if you do a good job, you, you pull customers from further and wider apart. So the actual pool of people that you can pull from is greater, you know? Um, so that's one. 
as a family, and I include our team in that, we love what we do. And I believe that that shows when people come in. Um, particularly with the new restaurant, we created a comfortable environment. When I say that, I spend a fortune. My electricity bill is, 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 is quite heavy because I want a place that in summer is a lovely place to sit. And, you know, with the summer we just had, it was boiling. Our place was lovely. It was air conditioned and all the rest of it. And then in the depths of winter, when it's snowing, it's comfortable and homely, you know, and it's cozy. And um, because of the heating systems and door heating systems that I've got in there. So I think that makes a difference. You know, when I look at the last shop that we ripped out, it was like sitting in a barn. You could be there, you need a coat on to eat your fish and chips. You're not going to get busy with that. Mm. So consequently, particularly through the winter months, that's where I've seen the, ma- the, the most growth in, since we did the refurb. Yeah. Because it's a much nicer place to come and visit. We continually strive to be better. A saying that my lot are bored with is next year, we've got to be better than we are this year. Mm. And I will never change on that. So I don't care whether we've got a customer that's been coming in 30 years or someone that's never been in before. They get the same treatment and love from our team. Mm. So that's a big part of it as well. Um, We reinvest. We reinvest in our business. And I think people like to see that. I think your customers like to see that. Um, We welcome singles. So when you get single diners coming, And we serve many, many, many single diners. A lot of elderly people, obviously, they are on their own. Well, you can tell your dad's retired then, if that's the case. (laughs) And we welcome them with open arms. I mean, you know, a lot of restaurant groups over the years have got it wrong with single diners. They see a single diner as a a waste of a table. In other words, they're only selling one seat. I don't. I see a single diner as paying you, as the restaurant owner, the ultimate compliment in choosing your restaurant. Mm. because, you know, normally when people go out to eat, they're going with somebody and there's a reason to go out. But if a single diner chooses your restaurant, it must be because they love the way that you treat them when you go in. So we do that and we do very well out of that. Then there's lots of things that we put money into that we don't get any money back from, but I'm sure they're very a big part of the way we build our business. Um, one is the kids pack that we do for kids. So we got a restaurant uh, pack that we just re- revised um, late last year called Ocean Heroes, um, which educates kids about plastics in the oceans and all that sort of stuff. And we put an enormous amount of thought into this pack and each one of those packs cost me 85p and we give those to every child that comes in. So when I buy a batch of packs, it costs me about five grand. And whilst we don't charge for them, I know for a fact that those kids are instrumental in deciding where their family goes out to mm. eat. And a lot of them choose us because they love the way we look after our younger customers. And so that's another reason. Um, the flowers that my mum does that I touched on earlier, the amount of comments we get from people that love that, you know, we spend over 5,000 quid a year on fresh flowers in our business. Wow. Yeah. That's not just the flowers on the table, that's the troughs that we got on the shop front. And you could look at that as just dead money. I don't. I look at that as a way of building business mm. and, and doing something different that my customers love. We never say no to our community. So when they come... I get emails every week, sometimes one, sometimes five, asking for raffle prizes for ex- or for support for good causes and stuff like that. We do the easy bit. Those guys are putting in the time. We just, we just hand over some vouchers, mm. you know. And I think your local community likes to see that you support various causes around, so we do that. But above all, um, one of the guys that has inspired me the most um, is part of a team in London and – called Corbin and King, and his name is Jeremy King. And he was once asked um, what he um, what makes a restaurant successful, a hospitality business successful. And he said, it's very difficult to define, but it's two words, heart and soul. I agree with that. Mm. I get, when I go 
not just fish and chips, but when I go up and down the country and I go in the best places that I visit, I get a feeling. And it's fair to say that that feeling's generally created by the people that work there. Mm-hmm. But I know exactly what he means about that heart and soul. Mm. And when I told you earlier about Golders Green, our experience at Golders Green, yes, it was a beautiful shot but it was soulless. And do you think that's because you can't get heart and soul from a takeaway? No, you can. I don't think it matters whether it's a restaurant or a takeaway. A few people have heard this story from me before. But quite a few years ago when I was judging, I was on the road and I was up in the northeast and um, I went to visit one evening. It was snowing. The weather was horrific. Um, But... I went to visit a shop, a mystery, I did, did a mystery shop on a shop in Bridlington um, called Fish and Chips at 149. In those days, it was owned by um, Matt Silk and Tracy Poskett. And in fact, that year it won Fish and Chips Shop of the Year. But I went to that shop on a snowy night. I was the only customer that walked in the shop while I was there. There were two members of staff behind the counter. Tracy and Matt weren't there. I think the girl's name was Amy. And I ordered fish and chips. And that experience to this day is the best experience of service delivery of our great product that I've ever had. And the way the service was communicated and stuff and the way I was looked after as a customer, and I can tell you, I looked like, I looked rough. Mm. I was, I I didn't, certainly didn't look like I was out judging. Mm. But the standard of service I got there was, was incredible and still the best I've ever had in any um, fish and chip takeaway. And that place, in my opinion, on that night had heart and soul. Mm. It was delivered by those two people. And, so I don't think it matters whether you've got a restaurant or take away or what. Mm. It's about having people there that genuinely love what they're doing, mm. whether the boss is there or not, and deliver a stat, uh, you know, go beyond, the, um, beyond what is required to, to deliver fantastic service. Mm. And, you know, that, yeah, so no, it doesn't have to be. A- so, so if we look back within the industry again, um, what was it like? in 2014 when you won the Outstanding Achievement Award? Uh, It was a nice moment. It was lovely. I mean, normally when you enter the awards, well, when you go to awards, you enter, you you know you've got a chance of winning because you've you've entered. Yeah. With that award, you haven't got a clue, you know, so it came out of the blue and um, it was voted for by other people in our industry. So, yeah, it it was a lovely moment. It was really nice. Hmm. And so, and probably for oh, as long as I've known you, you've been involved in, you know, judging um, sort of sea fish, dry white young fish fryer. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You know, do you enjoy it? What bit do you enjoy, enjoy the most? Well, I've been involved in that for about 10 years. Um, not dry white. I've been involved with the dry white young fries for the past three years. Um, I absolutely love it still. Um for a great number of reasons. Uh, one is, you know, I learn a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been in this game for 35 years. And if, if I'm in it for another 20 years, I'll continue to learn. I'm, I'm a student of fish and chips. So the funny thing there is that one of the first comments you said before you got in the industry was, how hard can it be? And your journey's been pretty hard. And now you're telling me that you like going out and seeing different shops because you learn from it. Well, yeah, but I won't be the first one from that profession, from the chefing profession, to think that our job is easy. Mm. Yeah. And I won't be the last. And, um, but it's not easy. It's really tough. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the biggest things I get out of um, uh, doing the judging. I, I, lo- I love what I learn. And, of course, I meet. Lots of great people, so I've made many friends. I travel up and down the country, the UK, and seen lots of beautiful places. You know, I've 
before I did the judging, I'd never been to Scotland or North Wales or the Lake District. And, you know, I plan on visiting those when I have holidays now because I found out they're so, you know, so gorgeous up there. Um, but, yeah, I, um, I love the judging. I mean, in particular, the last three years being involved with the Young Friar, that's been a, a great experience. I'm only involved in it at the final end. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of um, work that goes in before I see these young people um, and all the ones that I've judged are absolutely incredible. So it, hats off to the people that are involved in that competition at the earlier stages. And of course, you know, um, over the years, Briar and Kelvin and the family, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for what they've done with that competition because, mm. you know, that's really helped drive up standards uh, for young people. It's a fantastic competition. I think not only to drive standards, but to get the younger generation to actually stay in the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's brilliant. So Fred, the last 18 months, people have seen increased prices in um, fish and potatoes, um, 30% up on fish and double on potatoes. What's your sort of experience? What, what, would, you, what would you do to help? What, what could you tell people that would help them with that, get well, over that? Well, it's very difficult still because every business is different due to area and other factors. Um, but, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I, you know, yes, the prices have gone up to us, but we're busier than we were last year. The increase in turnover has wiped out the increase in cost that I've had. Mm -hmm. So whilst I might not be making any more money, I'm not losing money on where I was this time last year. Mm. Um, and you know, I don't want to pass on costs or do anything that affects my turnover. I, um, I realize this might be a little bit controversial, but you know, the old saying that profit is sanity and turnover is vanity. I don't believe in that saying. I think the first half of that saying is quite accurate, but the second half I think is garbage. Um, I, I, for me, turnover is what gives me choices in my business mm. and I will do everything I can to drive turnover and I will not do things that affect turnover. Mm -hmm. So being, putting my prices up when I don't actually need to, I'd rather try and ride it out. Mm. I mean, for me, the reason I think that saying is rubbish is that for me, nothing is more profitable than an extra customer. My lights are already on, my, my, my wages are paid, my, you know, my bills are paid. If I get another customer walk through the door, profit don't get better than that. Yeah. So for me, I'm very, very, um, I'm very cautious about my prices. I want to be great value. Mm -hmm. That's what builds business. And I don't disagree that fish and ships should be more money, but just because it should be more money, it's mm. no good just whacking your prices up and losing business and then you're yeah. in trouble. Um, you know, we'd all like to be charging 10 quid each for fish and chips, but I don't think, you know, the market's not there at the moment. Mm. I mean, uh, it is still good value. But what I look at is when people leave home with a quid in their pocket, I just don't think my competition is fish and chip shops up and down the road. Mm. My competition is, every, you know, those people have got that quid in their pocket, they're going to go out, they're, they're choosing where they're going to spend it. You know, 10 years ago, McDonald's had a cheeseburger for 99p. Today, they've still got a cheeseburger mm. for 99p. Now, yeah. whether you like it or not, it's incredible value. Mm. And we're up against that. So we've got to be very, very careful. So we'll see how it goes. I mean, there's talk that as far as fish is concerned, that this is now the norm, that we're not going to see any drop in fish prices for some time. Potatoes-wise... Hopefully the weather will be kind to us and from the middle of this year, you know, we'll be in a better state than we have been for, for the last... Um. Well, well, as you know, regarding fish, when, when I spoke to Bobby, um, he did say that it was interesting that when fish prices were 60 to 70 pound a block, or not a block, or what is it, 45 pound, yeah. no one complained. When, you know, and, and well, that's very true. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have had, you know, look, when we did the refurb, uh, actually, we've been refurbing some offices recently in the last few months upstairs. 
And part of that was clearing out the loft. And in the loft, I had 30 years worth of paperwork, which was quite interesting. And I found invoices from 1990 where we were paying a fiver a bag for spuds. Mm. Yeah, all right, it's probably a bad year. But when you look at where they are now, mm. and they were a fiver a bag then, and that's when I was charging 35p for a bag of chips, mm. it's not as bad as we think, no. you know? And um, don't get me wrong, <laughs> we'd all like the prices to be less, but it's just that the fluctuations have been pretty great, mm. you know? over the last few years, and I think it gives you a full sense of security, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm very lucky as well that I'm in a part of the country where portion sizes is not an issue. Mm. When you look at the recent talk that we've had over the last couple of years in, in our frying community about, uh, you know, prices and portion sizes and stuff like that, we've been doing the suggested portion sizes that everyone thinks we should be doing up and down the UK, we've been doing down, that down here forever. Mm. You know, they, they've been our portion sizes. A mini fish and chips, you know, a light, light a small bite, whatever you want to call it, we've been doing that for over 15 years. Yeah. That's not new to us down here. Mm. So I think that the real problem up and down the country isn't so much what we're paying for stuff, it's about those portion sizes. Yeah. And it's not by design that we haven't got that down here. It's just luck. That was the, that, those were the portion sizes that, were, um, that, that customers down here have been familiar with for mm. years. So let's, um, a few quick questions because I, I want to finish this at some point because I'm taking up a lot of your time. So in your time, what do you think have the, been the biggest advancements in technology? In technology, in my time... Within the industry, of course. Um, yeah, it's probably a Dutch range, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, going back to Christchurch when I opened it in 1988, um, I opened with a frying equipment which was called Frank Ford Satellite. They were modular units and you sort of clipped them together. You had overhead extraction and you had a separate uh, area for where you put your fish and chips. It's good, good... Good kit, you know. Mm. I had it in, we had it in my dad's shop, and I, I obviously liked it because I put it into Christchurch when I started that. But two months after opening Christchurch, I heard about Florigo, and um, I went to um, a shop in Skipton and saw a wonderful lady by the name of Jean Ritson who gave us lots of time, and mm. she's been instrumental in you know helping us all get on. And um, I went there and uh, she let me have a play on this range. It was an incredible range. It was 27 foot long, I think. It was a nine pound range. Mm. And um, I saw these round pans, which I'd never seen before. And as soon as I um, put the um, chip lifter in there and had a little play, I thought, this is for me. So I went back to my shop in Christchurch and uh, within a couple of weeks, I ordered a Fluigo range, So, which sounds ridiculous because I had a new some new frying equipment in there. But if I find something that I feel is a lot better or that can deliver a better product to our customers, make life easier for our team, I'll do it. Mm. I put that range in there. In fact, it's still in situ. They're, they're changing it now, aren't they? They're changing it this year. Yeah, yeah. It's 31 years old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I think, you know, I mean... Dutch ranges. I mean, I've for the last 15 years I've been using uh Karemka. I absolutely love them. Having said that, you know, I've got mates that have got Hopkins and love them, so each to their own. Yeah, but for me, the biggest game changer that I've seen is that Dutch range. Mm. I think it's made our lives an awful lot easier. Yeah, and in the industry, I know it's not gonna be one person or who's in, who's impressed you the most. Yeah, you're right. It's not one person. Um, there's a lot of people for a lot of different reasons um, that have impressed me. Um, as I said earlier, getting involved in the young fish fry competition, I've seen lots of young people that have just knocked me out, blown me away with how how good they are. You know, um, so that is they st they stand out for me in terms of those that of, you know, serving great fish and chips alongside other amazing seafood dishes, which I think is a fantastic concept. The two that stand out for me is Gary Rosser 
and Simon up at Long Sands. I think they are absolute leading lights in what they do and showing us another way that we can showcase this incredible product of ours alongside other great seafood dishes. And, you know, I see a lot of legs in that sort of concept. I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with their um, Instagram feeds, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, but the food looks amazing, doesn't mm. it? And it is amazing. And those guys are, you know, fantastic chefs and uh, they do, yeah, do a great job. I think that's been a great... Um, you know, great thing to arrive in our industry, to mm. be honest. Um, in terms of people that have done it over a great number of shops, um, Andrew Constantinou, who has helped me a lot over the years actually with advice and that, he's a very smart, clever guy and um, he runs an amazing business. And when I look at, you know, years and years and years ago, we, we just think, we just used to think that you couldn't do a chain of shops and do a great job. Well, he's about the trend. Uh, he does it day in, day out with his team, and they're amazing. The Lipscomb family, I don't really know them, uh, if I'm honest, uh, too well uh, personally, but I was fortunate enough to um, visit one of their lads, um, Luke, down in Hove, uh, as part of the judging for the Young Fish Fry a few years ago. And I went into this shop, it, uh, it's called Bankers um, in Hove and, and Luke was running that shop and I was absolutely knocked out by the standard in this shop and it actually had um, a feeling of being an independently owned shop and to think that was part of a big chain I think says a lot about those guys and how good they are at running their business as well. So that really impressed me. But above all else, what impresses me the most, and you know very well that people I'm about to talk about, I'm very close friends with. But what impresses me the most is when I look at Richard and Francis Ord of Coleman's in South Shields. And I know the business has been there since 1926, but Richard must have been in it now for the best part of 50 years. And when I look at the standards that have been maintained year in, year out, decade in, decade out over that time, I don't think there's anything more impressive than that. Mm. And there's other people that fall into that bracket, you know, the Magpie and other shops in Whitby and, and had a good friend of mine, David Hanbury, down in Torquay. These people have been nailing this job consistently year in, year out for, for decades. And so for me, that's the most impressive thing um, in our industry. And okay. those are the most impressive people. Brilliant. And three more questions. Here's one. Yeah. What is hospitality? Well, uh, I, just to interject, I'll tell you why I asked that question. It's because on. I've told you many times that I feel that people in our industry maybe don't think that we're part of the hospitality industry. And oh. you know, I massively disagree with that. Oh, we very much are. Mm. Well, I disagree with that as well. Okay, well, um, mm, what is hospitality? Well, I can only use a quote from um, a fella in New York by the name of Danny Mayer. I've read his book a number of times. It's called Setting the Table. It's a great book. And um, he defines hospitality as it's what you do for people rather than to them. And I think that encapsulates it very well. So when I went to that little shop in Bridlington, mm -hmm. Amy delivered fantastic hospitality. Mm -hmm. It was all about what she could do for me. It wasn't just the mechanics of service, mm -hmm. which is what you do to people. Mm -hmm. It's about the feel about it. Yeah. So that's what I think hospitality is. Mm. I could be wrong, but I agree with Danny Mayer on that. But it's I, think, I think that's a great description of what it is. More about the feeling. Yeah, yeah. And people that you maybe don't know as much, maybe from a book or people that you've read about, or maybe you do know them, you know, who has been the biggest influence to you? Um, well, the biggest influence is obviously Ian Neil. Mm -hmm. I've said enough about Ian, but he is my mentor. So, yeah, 100%. In terms of others, um, there's a couple of guys um, that I'm one of whom I mentioned earlier. 
That's Chris Corbin and Jeremy King uh, from Corbin and King in London. These couple of guys, for me, are the best in the business at hospitality. Their attention to detail is the best I've ever seen. Um, they don't have Michelin stars. They just serve great food with great hospitality in beautiful surroundings. And I've never seen anyone run a group of restaurants like these guys do. I'm fortunate in as much that I've been a customer of theirs for years and got to know them a fair bit. Chris actually is a Bournemouth lad. Um, so we have a chat whenever I see him in there. And um, when I look at how I've run my business, the, the way their attention to detail and everything is, is what inspired me to be the way I am in my business. So yeah, they, that, those, are the, those are the ones that have inspired me. And last one before we wrap up this. Yeah. What, book, what books have you read that you recommend that others read? Well, the one book I'm going to talk about is, um, um, it's an old book. It was um, first published in 1989, and it was Ian that told me to get it. I think he probably saw it, thought it would straighten me out on a few things, and um, it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, written by a guy called Stephen Covey. And it's a fantastic book. Ian told me to buy it, I think, about 94, 95, around that time. And um, it made me look at myself and reevaluate what I was as a person. What I love about the book is it's not about, the, in the title is the one word effective rather than successful. Mm. It's not a how to make money book. Yeah. It's about how to make yourself a better person, a happier person. And, you know, that can be better for those around you. And I... I think Ian saw in me that I needed a bit of that. Yeah. And um, it certainly helped me. It's based on, even though it's an old book, because it's based on principles. Principles don't change. Mm -hmm. They're around forever. So um, it's, it's, you do need to be able to be self-critical. You do need to be able to look at yourself and kick yourself up the arse and say, yeah. I need to be better at that. But I've never had a problem doing that. Mm. So for me... That was a that was a real game changing book, and I'm really pleased that Ian Ian um, told me to get a copy of it. Brilliant. So yeah, that's the one. And I think there's no reason why nobody else should buy that book because it's dead cheap. If you want to buy it used, they're everywhere. So yeah, yeah. it's a great book. It's I can highly I can highly recommend it. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Well, Fred, thank you for your time. And you're uh, very welcome. Thanks, Stel. I enjoyed it. Now you can go back to work or go back and tell people to do work. Um, nope, I'm going to work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but and I'm going to do some work. Yeah. I'm ever so grateful for your time. Pleasure. All right, mate. We'll talk later. Thanks, mate. Bye. Hey, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Fred Capel. I, I, I've known him for a long time, but I do think that his journey is really, really interesting. Um, I really hope we can also get Fred back on in the future because I think he can add a lot of value and just, just helping us with the way he thinks and talks. So don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and whilst you're there, tell all your friends about it. Thank you.